Hello, welcome to Bohannon Guitars. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you how I go about routing a mortise and tenon into the bodies and necks of my guitars and ukuleles. And I'm gonna be utilizing the Elevate Variable Mortise and Tenon Routing Jig. These are made by Chris Ensor, uh, somewhere in America where half inch aluminum grows. <laughs> this is the version two upgrade from the original non-variable version which I bought about three years ago and I've been using it for every build. It was excellent. It did everything that I needed it to but it was limited because I make guitars and ooks and it needed to be shimmed or put a spacer block in the mortise particularly to accommodate the different body depths. The original one it was limited to a three and a quarter inch mortise and a three inch tenon so while as good as the original one was, the new variable one is better in every way. You can cut a mortise that is both deeper and shorter than the original one. How it does that, it has a sliding system here. And when you use that in conjunction with these three side mounting points for the center line finder, the jig gives you the ability to dial in any depth that you want between four inches and an inch and a half, which is amazing. So I'll show this later on an instrument, but this is the mortise configuration. And to put it in the mortise configuration, you just bolt the alignment plate to one of the three mounting points. And you just use one of the three mounting points to roughly dial in the depth of the mortise. And then to fine tune it, you use the sliding mechanism. So with the three mounting points and the sliding mechanism, you can dial in anything from a dreadnought to a soprano uke or mandolin. So this is now in the tenon configuration. The center plate is bolted about halfway down. It uses the same sliding mechanism as the mortise, and it has a new set of three holes where you can mount the center finding plate to accommodate any position that you need. So this is able to cut a tenon length anywhere between three inches and 11 sixteenths, all the way down to an inch and a half, which is anything from a dreadnought guitar to a soprano uke or mandolin. It really accommodates everything and it is the best of all worlds. <laughs> so the angle plate that you move from the mortise to the tenon as you need to route each one, it's basically a square of aluminum with uh, a quarter of it cut out and this point here aligns with the center line of the mortise and the tenon and it indexes, that center line indexes off the center line of the truss rod channel and the hole in the angle plate accommodates a very elegant solution Chris Ensor from Elevate came up with. So the center of this hole is obviously the center line and this is a conical center pin and what this does it is able to be centered in any width of truss rod channel so for instance this is a typical quarter inch truss rod channel fits in nicely and because i make ukuleles i use a carbon fiber truss rod reinforcing rod and that's a eighth of an inch and that also fits in there thirdly because Stu Mac like to be a little different sometimes. They use a five mil wide truss rod. They're hot rods, I think they're called. And that also fits in there. So this conical shape is, it's a universal uh, centering pin. Now Chris also sells a quarter inch center finding pin, which just locks right in there and there's no wiggle and it's really good. If you're only using quarter inch truss rod channels, then I'd invest the $12 or whatever it is in one of these. Now, because I like to be customy, <laughs> I also had two one eighth center finding pins made by Chris and that just covers all my bases. So I've got the eighth inch for the ukes I've got the quarter inch for the normal truss rods and I use the conical shape for Stumax truss rods. So something that you may have noticed if you have extremely sharp eyes is my original one has just one hole and the new variable one has two holes for the center finding pins. So this typically only comes with the one hole which is this lower one here. I asked Chris to mill me 
this with two holes just because I prefer to use these center finding pins which I had custom made by Chris uh, rather than this center line uh, point. I just find it easier. So Chris does custom milling and it's really affordable. It's worth spending the small amount of money just to get an extra hole or whatever other custom options that you want. He'll accommodate everything. This is the original one and I've drawn a circle on here to indicate where I wanted a second hole and Chris accommodated perfectly so that's great. <laughs> the mortise and tenon one comes in two different versions. This is the 7 8 inch one so the mortise and the tenon are 7 8 wide and the other version is 3 quarters of an inch so 3 quarters of an inch would be the one that you want to buy if your heel shape is a typical kind of Martin classical guitar shape like this, it's a little bit thinner. The 7 8 inch version is better for a full width heel shape so mine just goes straight down at the body join instead of tapering in like a Martin or Collins or something. Uh, you can still use the three quarters on one of these. Depending on the size of your heel cap, you probably can't get away with using a 7 8 inch one if your heel is, you know, the typical traditional shape. But I prefer this 7 8 inch one because it gives me a little more width on the tenon so my when I put my threaded inserts in there's less chance of them blowing out so that's why I go for a 7 8 and lastly there is also a variable depth dovetail version of this so if you're a dovetail kind of a person and you are thoroughly against mortise and tenons you can find a dovetail version so just a word on the router bits that you should be using with this jig Obviously buy a nice new shiny sharp router bit and probably dedicate a router to it. I like to dedicate routers to everything. Chris on the elevateluthery.com website sells Whiteside Pattern Makers bit. It's number 3004. That is a one inch long by half inch wide and quarter inch shank. My mortises typically aren't that deep they only need to be as deep as my threaded inserts which are about a half an inch so the one i use is the white side 3001 and it's the same quarter inch shank and half inch wide but it's only half inch long and it just means that i don't have a really long bit flopping around so to speak and i like using this one more just because i if I only need to cut a half inch or slightly over half inch or under half inch uh, mortise then I don't want to have an extra half an inch of bit. Another thing that I added to this was a second bearing and that's a white side part number B9 and that just fits straight over the top of the one that it comes with normally and it just gives me a little extra depth. It's something that my mentor Gerard Gillet always tried to do if he could on his router bits and it's something I think is a good idea. So onto routers, you can use a laminate trimmer to do both of these jobs, the mortise and the tenon. However, I find that this particular job, I, I kind of want a little more uh, space down here, a bit more real estate. This always feels a little bit funny for this particular job. And having the on and off switch up here while I'm trying to hold this steady on here kind of scares me a touch. So I use one of the big boys <laughs> or girls, I'm not sure. Oh, it's, it's a bit of both. Um, so this just has a plunging element, which is kind of nice, but it also has the on-off switches, which is, you know, really easy to get to. So this is just a cheapie from Harbor Freight, as is this. Uh, you don't need a $200 router for this job. You, you can get away with a cheap router. So spend your money on the jig rather than a <laughs> router. And to prove that point, I have about 20 of these routers and I only have two good routers which I use for binding and purfling cutting. So that is more accurate 
and you need an accurate router when you're routing Perfling because you know 10th hour matters. So dedicate a router to this job and you'll be very happy. Throughout the video while I'm showing you how I use this I'll be showing you three jigs which I've developed to use in conjunction with this which I've developed over the years. Here's a sneak preview of two of them. <laughs> um, I've got another one over there. These are just things that you can make in like 10 minutes and it really makes the uh, the use of this easier, especially that and I'll show you that later on when I'm routing the tenon on next. So let's get to it. Okay, so it's time to route the guitar with the big router and finally show you how to use this. There's various considerations you need to think about before you start routing anything. That is what you want to fit to what thing. <laughs> that's, that's a really bad way of saying do you want to fit the tenon of the neck to the mortise or the mortise to a fixed tenon length? So how I do it and how I'm going to show you is I'm going to route the mortise first and then use the variable length, length tenon to exactly match the length of the mortise to the tenon and it makes more sense doing it this way. And the second consideration to think about is how deep to cut the mortise or how long to cut the mortise rather. So mortise will be this way, deep will be this way. Technically you could just cut a mortise half the depth of the upper bout. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you could. I tend to go almost all the way down and I stop about a quarter of an inch. I want to leave a little bit of meat here on the end block or as much as I can because it is just a smart way to build. If you, if you go all the way down, it weakens this spot. So leave at least a quarter of an inch. Uh, on the wall behind me, there's a really good plan by uh, Guild of American Luthery, which Kerry Char drew, and it's of a 1937 Gibson L00, and it gives a really good cross-reference of the neck area and heel area, and it shows the depth of the dovetail, and you can see that they left, you know, about a quarter of an inch, and I think they were pretty smart to do that. So the guitar body is set up in the easy guitar holder, it's just a simple clamping system, and accurately mark about a quarter of an inch quarter quarter of an inch ish quarter inch ish uh, it doesn't have to be accurate just you know a little fingers width that's fine if it's a 30 second deeper or less than a quarter of an inch uh, it just does not matter this is the mortise configuration of the jig you've got the mortise and the center finding plate and just keep this floppy and these just to uh, unscrew those so you can, there's some leeway here. Have the center line drawn on the top of the upper bout of the instrument. Place this down, vaguely in the center. So what I do first is to set the depth. So I set the depth of it this way. And I just want to hit the bottom of the mortise on the jig to the line. So after you've got the length where you want it, just lock this off. And when you are getting the depth, setting the depth, just obviously make sure that the center plate is pushed up against the top. So that's fine. And this can now be flopped around again because when you put it back, it's gonna be exactly the same. So the depth of the mortise has been set or rather the length of the mortise has been set. And what you need to do now is clamp accurately the jig or the center line of the jig to the center line of the top. Now, if the sound hole is larger or higher than this area of the plate, which is the center line, you can obviously draw the or continue this line onto the lower bout and then use a straight edge and figure it out that way. I came up with an easier solution. So at the beginning of the video, I alluded to three simple jigs you can make to make the entire process easier. My first little easy to make jig. 
It's a piece of Perspex which fits perfectly into the mortar slot and it has a really accurately measured center line on both faces and more, most importantly the end. And so I can just slot that in there and line up the line that's on the little jig, get it exactly on the center line. It's amazing. I love this little thing. <laughs> And another bonus of this little jig is that it can be used to scribe a, another center line on the jig, which it doesn't come with the, this center line. But I found that adding this center line is really handy. And I did it on my first version, and I'm going to show you how to do it on this one. So put a six inch ruler on the center line of the center alignment plate, uh, get a square and transfer it over there, scribe with a sharp awl right on the center line and then use the little perspex jig to double check that everything is correct and it should be as you can see here and then when it is correct that line on the top of the aluminum jig is in a perfect place you can see there to get a second or a third um, datum point for aligning the jig to the center line of the instrument and it just makes for a really foolproof method when you use all these in conjunction with each other so on the 16th of february i posted this video after i'd had the jig for a week or two of my little perspex jig and it got a lot of traction a lot of comments and questions and people asking where they could get it and so during that time chris asked if he could develop the idea and of course he came up with a far better solution than I did because he has a massive ensor brain and he came up with this fine looking contraption which he calls the alignment checker and whereas my old jig had only one kind of use which was just one center line down the center his does the same thing but he does it three times because you know he's got a big ensor brain and there it is on the website uh, you can buy it for what 23 24 dollars and he was kind enough to include my name against it or with it um, so there is the the pointy end and that is probably the first uh, center finding area of it and the second one would be the center of the main area which is just the the point alongside the the written center line part and you can use that to scribe the center line of the mortise that you've routed and that's very good if you you want to uh, drill some center line holes and when you drop it down you can see that it aligns perfectly with the scribe line that i added to the jig and here's the third aspect of this jig. It's got a little kind of arm that's coming out and you can use that to uh, locate right on the center line of the top. And it sort of works two ways because you can use it that way and then spin it around and use it that way. The little pointy outy bit works and you can also use the, the center um, slot to align it. So, and there's the first way again to use the point for various uh, aspects. So compared to the old jig, this new one is really good and I recommend getting it. I use it all the time now. Okay, so with this really accurate line drawn, using the really accurate little jig, when I put this on and line it up, line the top line up with this, I can also line up this point here. So it's far more accurate than just using this if you can't use this and it's having this and this uh, is probably more accurate than the ruler i i just use this method and it is always spot on so win <laughs> so now it's time to clamp it's really simple you just use a typical c clamp i use either two of these there's one in here already or something a little deeper it just depends uh, I have I use a full head block extension which makes clamping really easy so I can use one of these uh, if you don't use a head block extension and you're doing like Martin traditional sort of 
head block with the transverse brace down here. You'll probably have to glue a bit of um, a block of plywood or something on just so you reach over the transverse brace, but I don't need to. So just a quick word on clamping, and if you are watching this, you probably already know this, but when you align a jig and then you clamp it down, the jig probably moves. So just lightly pinch the clamps tight and then recheck the center line. <laughs> that, that's actually stayed on center line, which is a first while filming. <laughs> As you can imagine, if you film, things go wrong. But that that's great. And just clamp it up as tight as you feel is safe for routing, which is usually on the tighter side. So the clamps are tight. Last thing is to tighten the center plate down. Just make sure everything's flat. This is still sitting flat on the, uh, the up about. This is sitting flat against here. Um, Another word on clamping these two, put the clamps either distance from the center line because if your top has a, even a very slight radius, um, if you clamp, put a clamp here on the, so the center line's here, if you put a clamp here and then the second clamp here, this side will tip over more. So just put them roughly equal to the center line, which they are. Okay, so final checks are good, ready to route. Make sure you take that out. Um, so a rule of routing or plunge routing is you don't want to route deeper than the width of your router bit. So I'm only going to be routing uh, a little bit under half an inch. I don't bother measuring that. It's just, you know, a visual thing. Just be smart about it. And you just want to, according to how hard the material is, you just want to take it slow. So with this, I'll be... Uh, I won't be just pushing straight through. I'll be moving it in kind of a circular motion. You don't want to just plunge all the way through and then come out the other side and uh, pull back. It's just, it's far easier and safer just to take little circular cuts and you just work the, you know, in this case, seven eighths, just, just small amounts. Just take it easy, there's no rush. <laughs> Unless you're rushed. But, <laughs> but never be rushed when you're routing. And lastly, always wear ear protection, eye protection when you're routing. Uh, I'm gonna be looking down here, but I'm also gonna be looking at eye level at the router bit, just because um, I wanna know what's going on and I just wanna make sure everything's staying in place. Uh, so these are essential. And I look amazing. So another tip on using a plunge router or any router is to use the depth gauge if it has a depth gauge and just pretend the workbench is my guitar or uke. Plunge the router down so the bit touches the upper bout, lock it off and then you've uh, plunged the depth gauge down to its stopper and then raise it up the distance that you or the depth that you want to route. So in this case, I'm using a half inch wide bit. So the rule of thumb is to only route as deep as the bit is wide. I'm just going to use the depth stop and uh, lock it off at a, just a little bit under half an inch deep. And uh, then I'm ready to go. Another tip, don't start in the middle and then plunge down to your desired depth and then kind of just go free for all. Plunge down to the desired depth, lock off the router, and then work from the front, the front being here. Uh, you don't want to be just straight plunge into the wood. If you don't know this, sorry to say the obvious, but uh, with woodworking and tutorials, it's good just to be absolutely clear. I want to route down half an inch, so let's say it's about a little bit under half an inch. Let's take it to there for the first cut. And another important thing, you have to make sure that the bearing is going to be riding on the side of the jig. Otherwise, you're just gonna route straight into the jig and that is bad. And that's why I add the second bearing to this router bit. 
and any bit that I have a bearing on, if I can, it just creates a much safer way to route. Here's the first cut. It's around half an inch deep and I'm going to take a second cut of about an eighth of an inch and I'll use the depth stop to uh, help me with that. So that is routed beautifully. I do love a brand new router bit, I have to admit. Uh, and if I put the Perspex uh, jig in, it just fits perfectly and it's, there's no wiggle room at all. And that is why I love Elevate tools. <laughs> and uh, so that's the first half onto the neck and the third simple little jig to make life easier for you. So I just routed the guitar mortise and to be thorough and just to show what the variable mortise and tenon jig can do, I'm going to do a uh, ukulele. This is a baritone and I'm just going to leave an, the same amount, about a quarter of an inch. And the jig goes down to an inch and a half, which is, uh, that's even smaller than a soprano uke, which are the smallest. <laughs> so if it can do that, uh, it can do anything, it, you know, mandolins. But to do this, it's exactly the same procedure. I'm just going to have to move the center line angle plate from the third hole position, which gives you the deepest mortise, to the middle one, which will be absolutely perfect. And then just slide it to where it needs to be to exactly hit the mark that I made. All right, the jig is in position, it's clamped up. I use the little jig, I should give it a name. Barry, let's call it Barry. So I've placed Barry here. Everything's in on center. Um, double checking with the center line that I scribed on the actual jig and that's all good. So one last thing, I've set this up in my guitar clamp, but it's actually too big for a uke. Um, the, if I try and plunge a router down on this, the uke is gonna fall down. What I actually use is a Black & Decker Benchtop Workmate. <laughs> and I got this at a yard sale, it was really cheap. And what's good about it is, I can put this on here, it's just got the same curved padding that the big one does. And so when I put this in here, it doesn't fall through, and it just sits on the rails, so much safer for ukes. You could make a uke version of this and then put a bottom under it so it doesn't fall through. This is just two pipes. It's not really designed for use, it's just the width is way too big. But I've used this for about almost 10 years. Okay, so exactly the same procedure as before. I'm just gonna turn this this way, so I'm face on. The procedure for routing a ukulele tenon in the neck is exactly the same as the guitar, so I won't be showing a version of that. And when I put the little Perspex jig in, you can see that everything is dead on center. So now the mortise is cut, I've got to change the configuration of the jig to the tenon area. So I'll just loosen the, the sliding mechanism and leave that uh, loose. And then I'll reattach the center finding plate to whichever of the three locating bolt poles uh, is best suited to whatever length of uh, tenon that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be doing the guitar one, so I'm going to put it on the longest setting. This is the second one, and it's two bits of plywood, and I've used a length of carbon fiber. In this case, it's a quarter inch, and this is seven eighths, which matches, of course, my mortise and tenon. And what this does is it indexes into the truss rod, and I can quickly mark out the width of the tenon. It just makes it so much easier than getting a right angle and measure of the center line. And then marked out from the center line, seven eighths or three quarters. Just make one of these, it takes five seconds. And because I play both sides of the field, I've got a uke one which has a, a uh, 1 8 carbon fiber bit and that just goes in there. This is actually already done. Uh, another little trick of this jig is this part here is the width of the fingerboard. So I just mark down here and that is just a, another reference line which is 
so simple to make, I, I just make it every time. And the guitar one is two and one quarter, which is the, you know, a very common uh, width of fingerboard to have at the body join or 12th fret. Really simple, really easy, real handy. While this isn't a neck making video, I thought I'd quickly show all this. Uh, I've marked out the tenon and I've routed the truss rod and in this case I've got some uh, outrigging uh, carbon fiber rod things that's optional but uh, I've got the body join which is the 14th fret and I've extended that line down each side of the heel and that will come in handy and it's very needed for the next part. For guitars I tilt my table saw blade at about two or three degrees for ukuleles which have a tighter up about I tilt them at about four or five degrees. Then I just raise up the blade to the mortise line, or the, sorry, the tenon line, and then just take it back a bit because I don't want it to be full height, and you'll see why that is later. And then on the jig, which is a simple plywood U shape, I've scribed a line which corresponds to where I locate the body join line, which is why I drew it on the neck. These combination feud blades are really good so that's and that's as close as I get to the intersection of the body join line and the fingerboard edge line so just there's probably like a millimeter or something there just to, a bit of meat for me to use when I'm uh, manipulating the neck angle then I bandsaw it off leaving some wood on either side of the tenon and a good trick is to flip the neck over and so you get the tenon really you know straight up and down or a right angle if the body or the bottom of the heel of the neck block isn't at a right angle then you run the risk of a skewed line the one thing that i realized that you've got to watch out for if you do outriggers like this which is where carbon fiber goes down just make sure the wooden walls that separate the outriggers from the truss rod channel are at least one eighth wide because you can see if they're too thin they can deflect and it could compromise the integrity of the center finding mechanism so in the past i've hand fitted this i've just routed straight down and then hand fitted it by looking at the depth um i don't have to do it that way anymore because I have a variable depth one. And it's definitely easier to use the jig than to hand fit the tenon. I use my digital vernies and get a reading of the length of the mortise and I don't look at the number on the digital vernies, that doesn't matter. I lock them off so the they don't change and then I uh, scribe that line or that measurement onto the heel or rather the tenon of the neck and then uh, just make it a little more obvious with a pencil or pen. And with the desired length of the tenon clearly defined, then you can clamp on the variable depth jig and route. And it should be very close to being perfect. It's probably like 95% there. You might get lucky and get 100%, who knows, but uh, <laughs> try both ways. It's always good, and I always recommend uh, to try as many ways as you can think of, just so you exhaust all the ways to do something and then you have a knowledge of what's good and bad and why it's good and bad and why you prefer stuff uh, but i'm going to be using the variable depth feature on this because you know i paid for it so i better use it <laughs> so just a quick word about clamping a neck into a vise it's always been problematic to mount a neck straight up without the the uh calls kind of twisting and then you don't you you have a major lack of strength it's just flopping around and that was also the case with the you know the classic parrot vice um the trouble is this part here that's always the middle part and when you're when you have everything lined up like this it's just more weight on the top and it becomes a little more dangerous when you're routing you can get away with it by mounting it at an angle like that where the neck is in the middle of the vise but then you're at an angle like this but I came up with a solution it's a good one I think it's simple it's pretty much free and it's right there this simple ply block is my solution to 
the uh, neck mounting problem. So I've just quickly planed this surface of my bench so it's flat. With that surface being planed, this is perfect. I'm just going to glue this on and then I'm going to use two bolts which will just go all the way through. Probably not necessary but I've just got them and they're the perfect length. And then you will see the magic. <laughs> Here is the beauty of this. With this in place and that is flat, I can just put that there, clamp it to the block, and this is upright now. It's just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So much easier to route to see what's going on. A lot safer, I think, than tilting it in a vise. So I've got to say, I already love this jig. If you can call it a jig, it's just a block of wood, but uh, it's, this is such a better uh, way to mount a neck for this job. Lastly, use two clamps. Always double clamp when you're doing something like this. So you, the first thing you want to do is just to get this geometry into the jig. So the center finding angle plate is hard up against the top of the neck and this just butts straight down against the heel. Lock that off. Okay, so that's exactly hard up against this surface and that surface. So that's not going to change. And then we can just get some clamps and clamp it straight up and down. So easy. So when I do the final route, I'll be using two clamps to position this and hold it steady. But as we're just lining this up and getting it ready, one's enough. So once that's in rough position, just get to make sure this isn't flopping around like that. So with the neck clamped to the bench and the tilting mechanisms locked in place, just slide the jig down to the line that we scribed earlier to match the mortise to the tenon length. And of course, if the tenon is short or longer, you just need to adjust the uh, sliding mechanism in accordance with one of the three locating bolt holes. You just have to use the best locating pin for your truss rod. So like I mentioned before, I've got the quarter inch, the eighth of an inch, which is for ukes. And this neck is routed for a Stumac truss rod, which is five mil. Thanks, Stumac. Uh, so I'll be using the conical shape, which is a self-centering thing, is good for anything. Technically you don't need the quarter inch or I don't even need the eighth of an inch, but I find that I just prefer to use these in a quarter inch truss rod channel and alternatively a eighth of an inch truss rod channel. But these uh, self-centering ones are excellent, they're really good. So the reason why I got the second hole milled, which is a, a small add-on charge, was so I didn't have to rely on putting the center line of the jig on the center line of the truss rod, because it can always vary a little bit. You can measure it and it's totally fine, but uh, I just preferred to use two inserts just to lock it in place straight away. So these conical shaped center lining pins obviously fit into any width of truss rod and they just align themselves perfectly. So if you've only got one hole in the jig, which will be the top one, that will go there. Then you just have to align the center line of the jig with the center line of the truss rod channel. But if you've got a second hole, you can just use a second pin and it will align for you. So that's locked in place and this is just naturally on the center line of the truss rod. So I think you can see why I got the second center hole drilled by Chris. It just makes getting everything lined up so much easier and quicker um, than using the center of the angle plate. Um, but you know, I was using the first version of this jig for a year and a half until I realized that I could get a center, a second center hole drilled. So, I mean, if I can do that while filming 
and it's perfectly centered, then that just kind of speaks for itself because everything is harder when you're filming and everything goes wrong. <laughs> but that's ready to go now. I'll just put a second clamp on here. Another good thing about this block and it being on here, I can just use this as kind of a stop. So that just naturally stops there. It's just, it's so easy. And it's, like I said, I wish I'd thought of this 20 years ago. <laughs> so I'll put one high and then I'll put the second one and I'll just put another clamp on here. When you're routing, you don't want to mess around with not clamping something tight enough because things that spin really quickly scare me. <laughs> so clamp everything off really well. So I'm ready to wrap, but I just thought I'd take this off while it's all clamped in place, just so I can show you a view from down here to so you can see what's going on. So just make sure everything is locked off tight. It's easy to forget such things. Okay, so everything is locked in place and you can see the black lines on the tenon here that I made with my little jig. And so we've got plenty of meat on either side. So I cut it safely on the bandsaw. And now, time to route. So I'm gonna be using the same route a bit as I did for the mortise, but there are a few considerations to take into account. Before I mentioned the length of your router bit in relation to the bearings. So you just have to be careful that your router bit isn't too long uh, and you're not cutting off too much and that the bearings are still hitting the jig. The other thing you wanna be careful of is when you're plunging down, you're not going to be cutting into too much of the neck like that. That would be bad. So another problem with plunging too deeply or having a bit that's too long is if you plunge too far like this, if you're doing a traditional arrowhead style kind of Martin shape, uh, that would be bad because you'd be routing into the heel. I mentioned before that I my heels are straight down. So if I route in like this, it's actually not a problem. So I don't route into the heel. I just drop this down till I touch the heel and then raise it up a bit, lock it off and just make sure I can't go any deeper than that. And then I do my first route. I also double check that the bearings of the router bit are going to be indexing off the jig, which they are, so all good. Okay, so I'm ready to route this. Uh, I've tightened off everything, double checked everything. The depth is good, it's centered. Here we go. So I'm gonna demonstrate two different ways to go about the second route. And I'm gonna use two necks. This is the first neck, the mahogany neck. And this is the much safer way to do it. That's uh, what the neck looks like after the first pass. And then I take a second pass and then hand pare down everything. The second pass that I do on the maple neck is a little scary and I wouldn't advise it if you were an amateur woodworker. And I go about talking about why I do it and how I do it in the next section. So depending on the length of your tenon, you may be able to route that in one pass, but I'd take it in two passes. And uh, I find this just pairing back with the chisel a really pleasant part of uh, the job. And uh, I thought it would be nice to include the entirety of this footage, which is about two and a half minutes at the end of this video. So check that out. It's got a really nice sound of a chisel on mahogany. But I just pair this excess back then to fine tune the width of the tenon to the mortise. I use a sanding stick with like 120 paper and uh, just get it until it's fitting perfectly and then set the neck. Because uh, Chris from Elevate machines this jig so well, the mortise and the tenon, or mortise and the tenon, uh, the tenon is slightly, slightly too big for the mortise, and that's on purpose. But just to get this fitting exactly to the mortise, I just use a sanding stick and just give it a few swipes 
even amount on both sides. So I just paired this back roughly and using a tapered sanding stick I just evenly sanded both sides just a couple of strokes here a couple of strokes there until it fitted and it's just fitting I could probably I'll probably take a bit more off the sides but you'll be able to see how close I got it it's not um, perfect by any means but it's really close it's about a 30 second off so what I'll do is just take off a 30 second off the tenon just off the bottom there and then it'll fit I won't bother showing that but you get the idea one last thing my tenon is a little bit too long for the mortise so you just kind of measure, you know, the distance here and I'll chop this off about that much. I'm not too fussed about whether this is butting up against the end here. As long as it's, you know, close, it's, it's fine. So here is the maple neck, which I demonstrate a second alternative method to routing the second pass on. The first pass is exactly the same, that's what you're looking at there. The procedure I'm about to show will depend entirely on your hill shape and you'll only be able to do it if you do a heel shape like mine and if you're a klutz woodworker do not do this because it is dangerous and it comes with a real warning which i'm serious about okay so i'm going to be showing a little trick that i do with the router because i do my heels which are going straight down i can do the following thing but you can't do it if you are doing a traditional heel shape so i'm going to be talking about the perils of this particular job which I'm hesitant to show but I thought I'd do it just because I like to show everything that I know. Um, notice that the bearing is sticking like glue to the jig walls. If you get off that then you'll r probably ruin the neck. Uh, this is not something for the faint-hearted and you can't do it unless you do a straight up and down kind of Gibson-y modern heel uh, and it is easy to screw up so you've been warned there is one thing that you've got to be really careful of when you do what I just did and that is you absolutely have to keep the router bit and the bearings hard up against the the uh, jig because if you go out and you're you know at a, at a, a depth which you are at for this last cut you'll just go straight off and suddenly <laughs> you, you'll have a big gash here and it will be a horrible mess it might be a technique that I shouldn't show but if you're a professional woodworker and you just take care of what you're doing then have your wits about you when you do that second cut and stick to the jig boundaries don't go out of them otherwise you'll lose an neck if you don't want to do that just make the first cut and take it down to as far as you can and you might have to chisel out a little bit okay so just to make sure you understand what I just did I can only make that extra deep cut because my heel shapes are they go straight down from the side of the fingerboard. They don't taper in like a Martin. And what that means is I can, like you do on a dovetail or a, a Martin shaped arrowhead, I chisel in to make the datum point of the neck. There's less end grain to sand. See how I've pared away quite a bit here and here. And that just makes it so much easier to uh, fit a neck because you're not dealing with so much end grain and you can more easily take the wood down and shape it and manipulate it quicker just because it's you know sanding or planing end grain is really difficult <laughs> compared to any other wood so that is how I do it um, if you have a neck that or a heel that goes straight down you'd be able to do that too but um, otherwise don't do it and you can see here that I'm well within the the uh, fingerboard area that's another reason why um, you wouldn't be able to use a drill bit 
or a route a bit wider than half an inch because you would get outside the uh, fingerboard width. So I've still got about an eighth of an inch, which is absolutely perfect. That's what I go for when I used to do it, you know, with a chisel. But now I realize I can do it with this. Um, it's better. So it is much safer to do it like I did on this, which was to just route the general tenon length. Don't do this extra deep cut and then just take it down by hand with a chisel. Much safer and I would recommend doing that for the first couple of times and uh, you know try that if you want to live life dangerously <laughs> basically. And in case you're wondering I don't do this second uh, router depth stop on ukulele necks. There's just not enough room and I would stay away from doing that. Uh, do that by hand with a chisel. So I find it's pretty common that even if you measure really carefully, the mortise and the tenon don't come out exactly the same length. So this is how you hand pare down the length of the tenon. It's self-explanatory, I suppose, but for the sake of a full and helpful video, I will <laughs> do everything. So I just use a Japanese saw. The line is here and I get on the line and then just move it back a bit so I've got some room to play with. Be really careful of the heel here. You don't want to cut into it. So once I've cut straight down, I come in like this and get as much as I can. Then come in with the chisel. It's ready to pop off and that's done. Okay, then you just have to shape this end into the curve to what was routed for the mortise. So before you start shaping this end, what you can do is use the jig that you made to center the, the mortise. If you shape the end of that exactly to the mortise shape, then you can use the end of it to get a really accurate shape. You can also refine the end of the shape if you don't want it kind of chisel marky. You can just use the sander if you've just got a tiny bit to go. I've done that before and uh, you know, whatever works and if it works then it's a good way to do it. <laughs> it's not essential that the bottom of the mortise and the bottom of the tenon fit exactly. Uh, it's just kind of a woodworking thing that I like to do if I can get it, if I can. So that is a wrap for this video. I hope you learnt exactly how to use this jig and all the different ways that it can be used and utilised. Uh, I hope that the little jigs that I mentioned come in handy and that you make them. I, I think they're really good and the one that you can't see down here that you lock the uh, neck onto in an upright position instead of having it like that. Uh, the, the Elevate variable depth mortise antenna routing jig really is good. Uh, it's a it's like 10 times better than the first one because of all the uh, different depths that you can get and mounting points. There's six different mounting points. Uh, I would recommend getting a second hole milled by Chris uh, and then get a variety of the pins. I've got you know a couple of the center ones and a couple of the quarter inch ones and the uh, one eighth inch ones but you know if you're just sticking to one brand of truss rod and you're only doing guitars or only doing ukes then you you know you can just stick with one type of insert but I think that's it. I think I've exhausted everything that I know about this. <laughs> so I hope that was of help to you all and thank you Chris at Elevate. You make amazing, amazing jigs and I love buying them and using them for however long aluminum lasts. Probably a couple of hundred years. <laughs> so cheers, peace, thank you.